What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out what made Cody Rose's story so epic, man. This should be a great one. I'm definitely interested to check this one out. Ever since Cody has finished the story, it's it's such a beautiful thing to see how far he has come from the start of his wrestling career to him uh, leaving WWE to him being uh, making himself more of a household name on the independent scene to helping uh start up AEW to you know being a prominent figure in that company to ultimately come back to WWE and then actually finish his story and have one of the greatest WrestleMania moments of all time is definitely just a, a beautiful thing to watch so I'm guessing we're gonna go down memory lane check out some of you know his moments to where we are now in wwe and probably in aew i was definitely looking forward to checking this video out just just because i like to see stories like this it, it for me it's a motivational thing like you can start from somewhere and have a rough patch but if you stay to the course you stay to the grind and you believe into believe into yourself believe in who you are and what you you know the value you have you you'll be surprised or what the outcome could be for you in the future but you gotta always keep pushing through so let's check this out should be a good one let's do the damn thing one cell is this, this on? on april 7 2024 wrestlemania 40 cody rhodes stands tall and overthrows the over 1000 day reign of roman reigns awesome. this is the moment the moment every wrestler dreams of but yep. for someone who just nine years ago couldn't get an undercard mania match against his brother this seemed like it could never happen almost no journey to the top spot in wwe is a straight line but rhodes is one that zigged and zagged more than most his story That's... is one that shows believing in yourself knowing what you're worth and fighting for what you believe in can pay off extraordinarily like i just said believing in yourself y'all i literally just said that believing yourself bet on yourself because who else is There's no denying that he's become undeniable. Stories are at their best when they mirror the human experience. Even yep. in absurd escapism like professional wrestling, we gravitate to stories that we can relate to. Stories of envy, like when the mega powers exploded over Miss Elizabeth and neither man wanting to play second fiddle. <laughs> or Stone Cold's triumph over every obstacle that his tyrant boss, Mr. McMahon, threw in his way. Who yep. at one time hasn't thought about giving their boss the middle finger? Or a story like Daniel Bryan, whose hard work and connection to the fans forced his way into the main event match at WrestleMania even though the company didn't see him as more than a B-plus player. We can all relate to these stories in some way, which makes them more powerful. Cody Rhodes' story of believing in himself when no one else did is one that we can all relate to. And it's even more powerful because it wasn't just a professional wrestling story. It's the story of the man himself as he went off script to create a journey that has captivated fans beyond belief. Facts. Cody Rhodes was born June 30th, 1985. The half-brother of Dustin Rhodes, better known as Goldust in WWE, and the son of wrestling legend Dusty Rhodes. Rhodes. If you don't know too much about wrestling history or are newer to the product, you've probably still heard of Dusty, but might not know just how important he is in the wrestling industry. In many ways, the American dream, he didn't have the look of a typical megastar like Hulk Hogan or the revolutionary in-ring skills of someone like Randy Savage. But what Dusty did have was that he understood emotion and he was able to connect with the fans better than almost any other wrestler of all time. Rhodes' promo skills, even with his strong accent and untraditional tone, are widely regarded as some of the greatest in wrestling history. The son of a plumber took what others would see as shortcomings in his physique and heavy accent as strengths and created an everyman yep. gimmick that the audience absolutely adored. The fans yep. loved him and supported him in droves, making him one of the biggest draws of the 1980s. Rhodes mastered the emotional side of wrestling and understood his audience in ways few, if any, have been able to since. This made Rhodes not only a great wrestler, but also a historic booker. Wrestling is of course scripted and the booker is the one who decides who goes over in the match. And where the story goes, Dusty was one of the most influential bookers in history during his time with Jim Crockett promotions as they were competing against McMahon's WWF and Hulkamania. Rhodes was also historically a great commentator in WCW and eventually even a great trainer in NXT, working with some of the biggest names in the industry today. Rhodes' shoes are some of the biggest in wrestling history and almost impossible for anyone to follow. However, Cody was eager to do just that. After a successful amateur wrestling career in high school, Cody knew he wanted to join the family business and through his family connections began training 
training at Ohio Valley Wrestling, where he honed his skills and developed his character. In 2007, Cody yeah. made his WWE debut, first yeah. being introduced by his father and having a brief mini feud where he would protect his father against Randy Orton, who was portraying his legend killer gimmick where he targeted the greats of the business. The WWE showed that they saw Cody as a future star, giving him his first televised match against Randy Orton, though it ended in an Orton win. WWE further showed how highly they thought of Rhodes on the 15th Raw anniversary show, when along with Hardcore Holly, he won the Tag Team Championships, marking his first title. The next major event in his career happened when he betrayed Holly and revealed himself to be the surprise mystery yeah, partner of Ted this. DiBiase Jr. At Night of Champions 2008, they captured the titles. This makes Rhodes the only wrestler in WWE history to both lose and win the tag titles in the same match. Yep. <laughs> That's that that is kind of fire, bro. He he betrayed his teammate only to help out his future teammate to win the championship right back again. That shit was funny. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Along with DBRC, Rhodes joined the Legacy faction under the tutelage of Randy Orton. The gimmick behind Legacy was that they were a heel team of second generation wrestlers, playing mm -hmm. off the idea of nepotism in the industry, as DBRC and Rhodes often interfered in Orton's matches, keeping him at the top of the card. Joining a faction early in your career is a timeless technique used yep. to help wrestlers build a connection with the crowd and learn on the job under more seasoned superstars. Joining forces with more established wrestlers and factions has helped elevate the careers of many superstars. It wasn't until The Rock joined the Nation of Domination that his talent was able to be put on full display. Facts. It worked. It worked. There's nothing wrong with joining, uh, being a part of a faction or a stable. It can help you grow, find your character within the stable, and then eventually, once you, you know, find your rhythm, you're able to, you know, depart from that stable and, and you know, kind of grow your character independently. So it works for the most part. Sometimes it doesn't, but for the most part, it does. Or when Xavier Woods and Big E teamed up with the already established Kofi Kingston to create the New Day and elevate all three men. A similar mm -hmm. technique was used with Legacy's faction leader, Randy Orton, as part of Evolution, where alongside another rookie named Batista, they worked under the tutelage of the legend Ric Flair and the heavyweight champion at the time, Triple H. This also allowed for stories of both men yep. defecting from the group, automatically elevating them to main event spots due to their established relationships and then rivalries with the then champion, Triple H. Rose and DBRC were worked mostly as a tag team, but were also able to taste the main event scene and get screen time assisting Orton in his feuds and his quest to the title. Rhodes was able to make the final three in the 2009 Royal Rumble, a huge accomplishment for any wrestler, and he was able to assist Orton in winning the Rumble. He and DBRC also helped Orton in his feud against Triple H and the McMahons. Bro, this was such a fun feud. The match. Uh, didn't live up to the hype. But the feud itself, the storylines they were building between Randy Orton and Triple H and Randy Orton literally just kicking people into another dimension, giving people full case of the CTEs every chance he got. Depth's kiss, bro. It was so fucking good. <laughs> Rhodes and DBRC even got pay-per-view matches against D-Generation X, the legendary tag team of Shawn Michaels and Triple H. They even picked up a win against the team at Breaking Point 2009. These spotlights showed that the company saw promise in both Rhodes and DBRC, even though it is common knowledge that the WWE brass saw DBRC as the breakout player in the group. By the turn of the year, it seemed as though Rhodes and DBRC were ready to go their separate ways and receive singles pushes, but not after they would get a WrestleMania triple threat match between all three. In a match that puzzled internet wrestling fans, the decision was to not put either of the younger stars over and give the win to Orton. This breakup story, which once had a lot of promise, seemed to fizzle out, a trend that seemed to follow Rhodes throughout his time in the company. After the breakup, Rhodes was drafted to SmackDown, and his first chance to show what he was capable of as a singles wrestler was from a gimmick that came about in a surprising way. After a backstage poll of the Divas, they voted Cody Rhodes as the most attractive male on the roster. This started his gimmick as the dashing Cody Rhodes, yeah. a narcissistic heel gimmick, but one that Rhodes put his all into. It was quite entertaining. He would give the fans grooming tips and be overprotective of his face during matches yep. as he saw that <laughs> as his moneymaker. However, during a match against Rey Mysterio, Rhodes legitimately broke his nose, causing a turn to his character where he would now play undashing Cody Rhodes and lament to fans about how hideous he was and how the fans <laughs> were even worse. He would put paper bags over both audience members' heads and opponents he defeated. It was intentionally comedic as he would talk about his hideous deformities, but also where a clear protective mask where the audience could clearly see he was not deformed and looked the same. This character showed a lot of promise, putting great character-based promos and even capturing the... It's just the idea of this whole situation was hilarious, but him 
getting the Intercontinental Championship and, and bringing back the old school version of it, that shit was cool. That was like the best moment of this like character arc he had. Bringing back the old school IC title uh, design was so great, man. We gotta. Run that back just a little. By his hideous deformities, but also wear a clear protective mask where the audience could clearly see he was not deformed and looked the same. This character showed a lot of promise, cutting great character based promos and even capturing the Intercontinental title, the secondary men's championship in the WWE. Cody has gone on record talking about how he saw this as some of the best work of his career, and he was able to really take charge creatively as he would craft the promos himself. It's no secret that the modern day WWE has a creative team filled with writers who create the storylines and help script the promos. But some wrestlers are given more creative freedom and ability to have a lot of say in where the character goes. And with the undashing gimmick, Cody got a taste of this and absolutely loved it. However, even though Cody was showing all the promise in the world, the gimmick fizzled out. And Rhodes spent the next few years firmly cast in the mid card, starting yeah. a tag team with Damian Sandow, known as the Rhodes Scholars, that though quite entertaining, was never able to capture the belts or get a serious push. In 2013, the authority angle where Triple H and company was meddling heavily with everything in WWE, Cody stood up bringing in a oh, real life feud between the McMahons too. and the Rhodes, mentioning how they put Dusty in polka dots when he came to the WWF and how they forced his brother into the insane Goldust gimmick. One thing to know is that it is true that Vince McMahon has long disliked anyone who has made their name away from his company. Mm -hmm. Dusty, who was one of the biggest stars in the world, ended up wearing polka dots and mainly being a comedy wrestler. Basically, if you were a star somewhere else, Vince will torture you until you've earned your stripes in the WWE. As part mm -hmm. of the storyline, Triple H fired Rhodes after a loss to Randy Orton. This was to allow Cody to take some time off because he had married his now wife, Brandy Rhodes, at the time a backstage commentator for the company. Before he came back, both his brother Goldus and his father Dusty side cutting promos. This was, bro, this was such a fun feud. Oh, I love this feud, bro. This was such a good feud, man. Uh, the Rhodes versus the Authority, and then the Rhodes versus uh, the Rhodes Brothers versus the Shield. One, one of, man, that match alone, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to talk about it so great was fighting for Cody to be reinstated. And after the authority had Big Show attack their father, Cody and Dustin jumped the barricade yep. and took out the authority's attack dogs at the time, the Shield. This led to a match at the 2013 Battleground pay-per-view, where in an extremely emotionally satisfying oh match, God, Cody and so Goldust weird. teamed up to beat the Shield and get their jobs back. Shortly after, they won the tag titles and things seemed to be going quite well. However, after losing the titles, Cody would leave briefly and return as Stardust, a tribute yeah. to his brother's gimmick where he would wear face paint and work in a full body suit. For a non-wrestling fan, a gimmick change like this might be shocking, but gimmick changes can often catapult wrestlers into much more promising positions. Take Charles Wright for example, who in the early 90s wrestled under the gimmick as Papa Shango, a voodoo practitioner, then he turned into Kama, the ultimate fighting machine, more of an MMA type competitor, until he finally found the gimmick <laughs> that would suit him best in the Attitude Era, when he became the Godfather, a wrestling pimp. Another simple <laughs> example is that of JBL, initially a career mid-carder known as Bradshaw, who was a red neck hard-nosed brawler but then in storyline hit it rich in the stock market and started going by john bradshaw layfield an aristocratic texan who would flex his wealth this gimmick change jumped him immediately to the main event scene even being able to capture the wwe title so gimmick changes are a part of wrestling and wrestling fans will accept them as long as they work but not all gimmick changes are created equal there are oh. countless examples of gimmick changes that don't work and stardust was just that stardust yeah. debuted in what many people call the reality era where the characters that were becoming stars were the likes of CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, grounded characters that were less gimmicky but loved wrestling and would give anything for the business. Eccentric gimmicks weren't succeeding like they did in the past uh -uh. and Stardust was certainly not working. After tagging with Goldust, the two broke up and started a feud they had hoped would make it to WrestleMania, but instead the blow-off took place a month before at the Fastlane pay-per-view in a lackluster nine-minute mid-card match. Cody felt this was a slap in the face as he believed yeah. his story was worthy of so much more. He argued with WWE creative to get him out of the Stardust gimmick, but to no avail, he continued to bounce around the mid-card with little creative direction whatsoever. In 2015, his father Dusty died, which devastated him, and Cody begged creative to allow him to go on a sympathy babyface run, similar to that of Rey Mysterio's yeah. main event run after his best friend Eddie Guerrero had passed, but they kept him as Stardust and didn't give him anything to do. He was stuck. Which sucks, bro. <laughs> It fucking sucks, bro. Your father dies and you, you can't even really truly be yourself out there. It, it, you know, it would have been a better situation at least for his character to really convey how he felt. And the fans could really 
bought into that and, and understood and had sympathy and you could have made a better star not to say you're trying to take advantage of a, a real life situation like that but at the same time that's his dad and it's like y'all forcing this guy to be a character that it's not meant to be taken seriously like it sucks it's like a slap in the face especially considering all that their father has done for the business it's, it's messed up Stuck in catering. This is an inside joke about wrestlers who tour with the WWE but aren't used very often, which suggests that many wrestlers have wasted the primes of their careers just sitting in catering, the purgatory of wrestling. But Cody wasn't going to let that happen to him. He finally acknowledged that WWE didn't see him in the same way he saw himself. This caused Cody to do something that at the time was quite rare. In May of 2016, Cody asked for his release. People were somewhat shocked as the Rhodes had worked for the company for so long. Rhodes later shared that Triple H took Cody's departure very personally because of every he had done for his dad but cody felt that he had to leave and decided to bet on himself cody he had to bro he had to leave they weren't gonna do anything with him he had to leave he had to do what was best for himself Cody isn't the first wrestler to leave WWE, far from it. Modern wrestling comes from the territory days, where wrestlers would move around promotions all the time. And then during the Monday Night Wars, wrestlers would constantly switch back and forth, going to whichever side gave them more money and a bigger opportunity. However, in the 21st century, after the fall of WCW, leaving the biggest show in town wasn't as attractive. In most cases, the wrestlers who left were forced to go, like Jeff Hardy going to TNA because of his substance abuse problems, or Eddie Guerrero working on the indies after being fired for the same reason. Even Cody's brother Dustin had left in 2003 but again this wasn't by his choice as wwe didn't renew his contract all these wrestlers eventually came back and were given more prominent roles once they came back but none of their departures were by their own choice cody had gone where very few wrestlers had gone before and left because he felt he deserved more the other difference is that there wasn't really a top promotion to jump to tna yeah. was now called impact and the top of the card was mostly run by former wwe guys like drew mcintyre and bobby lashley two other guys who left the company and became bigger stars than they were once they returned but both both had to wait a couple years until their true main event pushes came back. The path to leaving and coming back was a possible one, but it wasn't going to be easy. Once he was gone, Cody started working on the independents uh -huh. everywhere he could. The fact that he was still well known from his time in the WWE made him an instant draw, but he also started creating a new character, the American Nightmare Cody Rhodes. A play on his father's nickname of the American Dream, Cody was a natural heel in the indies and made himself one of the hottest names. Around this time, the American indies were having a bit of a renaissance as a large group of extremely talented wrestlers were making names for themselves outside of major promotions. One thing that helped Cody was in 2016, the independent and non-WWE wrestling scene was going through a boom. Tons of fans looking for an alternative had found one on the indies yeah. and abroad in companies like New Japan, which was in the middle of a true golden era. Around this time, New Japan saw a great influx of North American fans, in large part due to the Bullet Club. Originally started by Prince Devitt, who you may know better as Finn Balor in the WWE, they were a group of non-Japanese wrestlers who would use interference and more Western wrestling tropes to win matches. And they were probably the hottest faction in all of New Japan at the time. Along with his widespread indie dates, Cody started working in ROH, the company that seasoned great wrestlers yeah. like CM Punk, Daniel Bryan, Kevin Owens, and even Sami Zayn. Luckily at the time, ROH had a working relationship with New Japan, which Cody would also work for and become a member of the Bullet Club, where he met and quickly gelled with Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. And they started a small offshoot within Bullet Club called the Elite. The Elite were a large part of what was making New Japan and the Bullet Club so popular. Their YouTube series Being the Elite, which Cody often appeared in, was extremely popular, and their merchandise was selling like never before. Over the next two years, Cody worked his ass off alongside his new friends in the Elite, and he became a face of the indie revolution. Then in 2017, the most well-known wrestling journalist in the world, Dave Meltzer, responded to a tweet asking if ROH could sell 10,000 tickets, and he said, not anytime soon. Cody responded to the tweet and said, I'll take that bet. Cody and the Young Bucks promoted a self-funded show that sold over 10 10,000 uh, tickets uh, in less yeah, than 30 minutes. The event which... Yep, I remember that. I remember that. And once again, betting on yourself place in September 2018 was a commercial and critical success and Cody was able to capture the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, a belt his father helped to make famous in an emotional match. But things don't stop there for Cody. At the event, Tony Khan, son of billionaire Shahid Khan, who owns the Jacksonville Jaguars and Fulham FC, met Cody and the Bucks and asked if they were interested in creating their own company. Thus, All Elite Wrestling was born and Cody was not only the face of the company in the ring, but also an executive vice president. After and here's the thing. People don't want to admit this, but Cody leaving 
and helping start AEW is the reason why we got the moment we got this Sunday. It's the reason why he was able to finish the story. It's the big reason. Yes, obviously, Triple H and the management in WWE has to pull the trigger, but they don't even think about bringing him back in the first place or want, you know, wanting him to be back in the first place if he doesn't make his a name for himself outside of WWE and if he doesn't actually start up AEW, help start up AEW. It worked. It that's that that's part of buying into yourself because now he's able to come back and be and he's a bigger star for it. So you got to give credit where credit is due. Him helping start up AEW, Tony Khan. It this is those situations where it's good to have some competition like this because it can help potential storylines like this happen. That's all I'm saying. After signing up a large portion of independent wrestling stars and some former WWE greats including Chris Jericho, AEW started off with a pay-per-view double or nothing, mm -hmm. where probably the match of the night was Cody versus brother Dustin. Yep, the same match. match that WWE didn't see as being WrestleMania worthy just a few years prior. It had become clear that Cody was the emotional workhorse for the company, doing southern style bloody brawls, the same kind that his father had become so respected for. People loved Cody. He was a massive star and really the face of the non-WWE contingent of professional wrestling, a man who had gone out on his own and became a bigger star because of it. In a famous segment from his match against Dustin, yep. he came out with a sledgehammer and busted a throne wide open. Many people saw this as a shot against Triple H, who when he was a performer was infamous for using a golden shovel and burying newer talents. In contrast to this, Cody made an effort to put over younger talent. Cody wrestled in the first ever match on AEW's weekly television show Dynamite against young up-and-comer Sammy Guevara. He also put over newer stars like Darby Allin and MJF and cut some famous emotional promos. It took me to go from undesirable to during the first year of the company, he was untouchable. However, as time went on, he started to linger. Cody ended up getting in some feuds that seemed to go nowhere with the factory, Anthony Agogo, and even Shaquille O'Neal. Yes, yeah. the basketball player. The Agogo <laughs> feud was particularly criticized from fans, bringing on an anti-British sentiment that felt very not of the era. It's important to note that at this time, Cody was a huge star, being a host of the Go Big Show and representing AEW on talk shows and at other press events. He was a huge draw. However, a portion of the hardcore fans who happened to be the most vocal started turning on Cody. Mm -hmm. People call this his Homelander arc because he saw himself as a conquering hero, but the fans were turning on him, wanting him to turn heel like the comic book villain. I held every grain of the revolution in my hand, and each and every one of you cheer! At this time, AEW was bringing in a lot of big stars, the likes of Brian Danielson, Adam Cole, and CM Punk. And these competitors were signing huge contracts. As one of the founders and main faces in the company, Cody wanted a larger contract, but he couldn't come to terms with Tony Khan. In January of 2022, Cody lost the TNT Championship to Sammy Guevara, and though no one expected it, this would be his last match with the company. A month later, Cody and his wife Brandy announced that they had left the company. And after lots of speculation and people thinking that this was a work, Cody ended up returning to WWE yeah. and this is where the story becomes special. At WrestleMania 38, Cody was the surprise opponent for Seth Rollins in one of the most anticipated returns in years. And Such no, he didn't match. return as Stardust, he was the American yeah, Nightmare, Nightmare Cody Rhodes. Same entrance, almost the same attire and he brought with him the wrestling style that he had developed on the independent scene. They wrestled one hell of a match. After 21 minutes Cody was victorious. This was a huge deal because Vince McMahon is notorious for changing the gimmicks of wrestlers who Facts. join or come back to the Which is crazy. I, I want y'all to understand, he, they kept him the same. They didn't change him. They kept him the same, which is wild because Vince doesn't do that. So the fact that Vince did that, at, like that's wild. But it also shows that they knew you had to keep him the same because you can't turn him back to, to Stardust or no. You, you had to keep him as the American nightmare because that's what people want to see. And it worked. Company, but Cody was able to be the character that he had found himself as after he left. The next night on Raw, Cody cut a powerful promo about his time away from the company and how it was his dream to win the title that his father never could, the WWE Championship. And that was his reason for being there. Yes, I cannot physically 
put that title belt into my father's hands. I cannot bestow it upon the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, but I certainly can put it around the waist of the American nightmare. Some fans were wary of Rhodes, happy to have him back, but unsure what made him different than the mid-carder he was before. But then, Hell in a Cell came along. After continuing his feud with Rollins, they were scheduled to have a blow-off match in the main event of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. But in the days leading up to the event, Rhodes legitimately suffered a pectoral tear while weight training, but Cody decided to fight through it. Before the match began, he took off his entrance robe and revealed an extremely bruised and battered arm. Wrestlers have worked through some serious injuries, but this may have been one of the most graphic injuries we had seen a wrestler power through. Facts. And he did more than just show up. The two wrestled an incredible match, rated five stars by Dave Meltzer, and Cody was victorious. This match, in many ways, was a microcosm for his story, battling through all sorts of setbacks to become the star that only he saw himself as. Some fans might still not believe in him, but there is no doubt that he's worthy of his spot. In what could have Facts. been the lowest point in my career, in what could have been the absolute worst night, in what was literal hell, I was not cynical, I was not jaded, I stood. I fought! Of course, the story doesn't end there. Cody received surgery for his injury, forcing him to sit out the rest of the year. But Rhodes returned at the start of 2023, saying he was still looking to win the WWE Championship and that he'd be a participant in the Royal Rumble. Rhodes ended up winning the Rumble, securing his main event spot at WrestleMania. The American Nightmare! One step closer to the American Dream! So good. From dashing to stardust to the main event! Even though many fans saw this as a huge win, and while he was super over and popular, he wasn't the most over guy in the company. That would be Sami Zayn. Yeah. But even if you believe Sami's excellent white hot run deserved him a spot in the main event of WrestleMania, there's no doubt that Cody also deserved the same. Sadly, in wrestling, not everyone can win. And after looking at everything he overcame, there's no doubt Cody deserved his moment in the sun. Rhodes took the Rumble spot and ran with it. With each passing week, you could feel the support building, not just from the fans, but from Rhodes' peers. Cody was riding the wave, knocking every promo out of the park. I intend to finish my story. You need to finish yours. It seemed like everyone wanted him to finish his story. I have to finish the story. It's not just a dream. It's not just an urge or a want or a desire or some story that needs to be finished. This becomes a necessity. To the point where going into WrestleMania 39, it was near unfathomable that Rose wouldn't come away with the win. Spats. But this is where the story takes yet another turn. Cody lost at WrestleMania, but one of the biggest takeaways from the event came during the post-show press conference when Triple H declared that in wrestling, the story never ends. In the WWE, the story never finishes. No matter what happens, it continues moving and the show just goes on. So after everything that happened in Rhodes' career up to this point, he had to keep going. As one chapter ended, a new one began. Rematch. This is the part where Cody proves he's the undoubtable number one. The old saying, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, rings true. The American Nightmare was going to perform like the top babyface, carrying the company on his back, mm -hmm. wrestling all the house shows, staying after the matches, taking photos, signing autographs. This was going to be the year Rhodes showed everyone that there was no denying he was the uncrowned world champion. Cody's yep. ascent back into the WWE Championship picture took him through a grueling war with Brock Lesnar. Like Rhodes, Lesnar had felt the brunt of Roman Reigns of the Bloodline faction to the point where Brock could no longer challenge Reigns for the title. A Cody victory at WrestleMania was Lesnar's chance to wrestle for the belt again. This meant Brock took Rose loss personal. Cody went into their clash at SummerSlam with the aim of not only surviving Brock, but defeating him to the point where there was no question he'd saved the beast. A rare token of respect shown by Lesnar after the bell spoke volumes. The fact it was unplanned and not in the script made it even more special. It was poetically symbolic. It felt like Brock had given Cody his blessing and approval to go on and succeed where Lesnar had failed. The message defeat Roman Reigns for the WWE Championship. Mm. Going into the 2024 Royal Rumble, the American Nightmare was the hot favorite. He certainly had more competition this year, what with the long-awaited return this of so CM Punk. Too. But there was only one outcome fans wanted to see. They had been on this ride with Rose from the start, and it wasn't going to stop here. Yes, there'd been some setbacks, twists, and turns, but surely now the rest of this tale would be as straightforward as Cody pointing at Roman to declare who he would be challenging at WrestleMania 40. But if you've been following this story up to now, then you know nothing was going to be as clear-cut. For years, oh. fans speculated if Roman Reigns would ever battle his cousin The Rock. 
and if so, surely it had to be on the grandest stage, especially given the bloodline storyline that Pete reigns as the tribal chief of his family. But these rumors came and went every year. This match couldn't happen now, not when the biggest babyface since Daniel Bryan or if not John Cena was due to challenge for the title at the show of shows. In actuality, The Rock vs Reigns had been booked privately the previous year. However, Rock had to pull out. But now that Dwayne Johnson was a board member of TKO, WWE's parent company, it was logical that they would want him to main event the first WrestleMania under their new ownership. So when Cody shook The Rock's hand and gave up his shot to wrestle Roman at WrestleMania, collectively, it felt like every WWE fan's heart sunk all at once. Facts. The subsequent outrage and discourse online told us what we already knew. This, that, that's crazy, bro. The fact that the fans vocalized how they did not want to see this match. Not right now, but just it wouldn't, the timing wasn't right. And they actually course corrected because they didn't have to. Well, let's be real. They didn't have to. The match was still going to be a big time match, but they did. That's crazy, bro. That's what makes this part of their story that much sweeter, bro. Cody Rhodes was the out and out people's choice to end this near four year title reign. Not even a legendary icon like The Rock could change that. You've got to finish the story. <laughs> All eyes were on WWE at this time, and amongst every sellout show, Cody was a workhorse, showing up every night. Reigns only worked select shows after all, not to mention The Rock, who hadn't wrestled a proper match in 11 years. If The Rock and Roman story was all about family, then it was made all too personal after Rock and Cody got physical at the WrestleMania press event. And Cody's just trying to finish his story. Can you explain what that is? I think Cody's reading the wrong book at this point, because don't nobody care? We don't care about his story. Fuck your story. <laughs> every time Cody appears in WWE, we hear the words, wrestling has more than one royal family. Wrestling has more than one royal family. Truer words were never spoken when it came to this story. And while order was restored and Rhodes was once again granted his match at WrestleMania with Roman Reigns, The Rock's involvement was going to make things very interesting. He would tear The Rhodes' legacy down with each promo. Family had been so integral to this story already, it was only right that it played such an important role in this chapter. In his quest to finally bring the WWE Championship to The Rhodes' dynasty, Cody would now have to defend the honor of his family at the same time. I'm not number two. I'm the one. And at WrestleMania, if the American Nightmare lost to Roman, he would no longer be able to challenge for the WWE title ever again. This is wrestling storytelling at its best. Mm -hmm. It grips the audience and takes us on an emotional roller coaster. Fans watched WrestleMania 40 to see Cody Rhodes go up against The Rock and then Roman Reigns for the title, mm -hmm. not just because it was marketed well or created such a buzz. People tuned in because it made them feel something. When wrestling is this good, it becomes real. And Cody Rhodes' story Max. has always been real. So now it was so time good. to finish the story for real. And that brings us back to where we started. Cody stands tall at WrestleMania, holding the title his legendary father never could. He's the top guy in the company that many believed he would never work for again. A company that just a couple of years before didn't have anything for him creatively. He may not be everyone's favorite, but we can all relate to his story. The idea of feeling stuck where we are, feeling like we deserve more, but Cody did the hardest thing he could. He left the comfort and security of the WWE, worked on himself, worked his ass off all over the world, and came back a bigger star than anyone. Because Cody believed believed he could. That I hope I lived up to your name. <laughs> and thank you for that name. In Cody's words, he went from undesirable to undeniable. Beautiful, and just like all great stories, there is something for us all to learn from Cody. Believe in yourself. And just maybe, you can not only prove doubt was wrong, but more importantly, prove yourself and the people who believed in you right. Hey man, that got me, bro. Man, I'm gonna go ahead and like this video bro oh my god bro that got me man it almost got me at the end bro this like i said at the beginning of this video his story is so inspirational because he didn't give up when many others would give up he didn't give up he bet on himself he bet on himself and if y'all don't take anything from this always bet on yourself Take that leap of faith. It can be scary, but take that leap of faith on yourself because if you don't, no one else will. And the fact that Cody did that, and now we can say he's the top guy in WWE. 
It's a beautiful thing to see, bro. But comment down below. Let me know. Did you guys enjoy Cody's story? I know it's not done, but the story of him chasing the title, overcoming all adversity to get to where he is now, to be the guy, to hold the championship that his father never got a chance to truly hold. Did you guys enjoy it? Because me personally, I think it's one of the greatest stories WWE has ever told. It's up there. And I love it. Could it have been done better? Of course. But the ending was perfect. But I appreciate all the love support. Road to 150K. And I'm still here on Speedy YouTube Wrestling Champion of the World. Appreciate y'all kicking in with me. See y'all next one. Peace.